times of chaos and breakdown, where might we turn for guidance? To the myths, the storytellers, the wisdom keepers, and the rabble rousers. To the ones braving the seas of uncertainty, not with answers, but with poetry, beauty, and well-crafted questions. I'm Ian McKenzie, co-founder of the School of Mythopoetics, a place to gather with like-hearted folks to navigate the mysteries together. And this is The Crow's Nest, where I speak with an array of guests who are employing their mythic imagination to engage with the tempest of the times. You're invited to join me live on YouTube each week. Visit schoolofmythopoetics.com slash podcast to learn more. And now, enjoy our conversation. Greetings, friends. Once again, this is Ian McKenzie here, and I'm the host of The Crow's Nest, and I am delighted by our conversation today uh, with my guest. Um, one, because of uh, the connection, at least I have through uh, through this new offering that's come forth, or at least the latest iteration, uh, and the legacy of Daniel Dierdorf, which is uh, one that I first encountered through, it was a telling of Iron John, actually, with uh, Martin Shaw, which is sort of a well-known um, story, of course, that Robert Bly made famous with his book. But there's a telling on YouTube, sort of four parts, which I believe happened at um, one of the uh, men's gatherings that has been made available. And um, it's just so delightful to see uh, Daniel in in this tale with Martin and their camaraderie and their connection. Yeah, it was just such a, a powerful way to hear the story and the way that was unpacked. And um, I, sadness grew up in me or, or came, I came to sadness re realizing that Daniel had passed a few years ago as well, and I would never be able to, to speak with him directly. And so uh, I'm delighted here to welcome my guest, uh, Judith K. Friedman, who is the, uh, handles the legacy of Daniel in his body of work, and in particular, his new edition of his book, uh, which has come out soon or, or is out in some places, uh, to talk about that, also uh, her body of work, and um, yeah, I'm delighted to welcome this guest. So a few more words about her. Judith Kate Friedman inhabits the flinty places where art, activism, ritual, and oral tradition dance. She sings, composes, writes, performs, curates spaces, produces events, and tends hearth fires, tells stories, and makes records. As partners in love, life, and creative collaboration with myth singer, myth singer Daniel Deerdorf. She now carries his music teachings and myth telling as steward of the Myth Singer Legacy Project and is representing his book, The Other Within, The Genius of Deformity in Myth, Culture, and Psyche. So I'm delighted to welcome Judith Kate to the show. Welcome. Hello. So good to be here with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to hear a little of maybe your take on Daniel, uh, who who he was and is to you. Uh, I mean, being life partners and feels like just deep collaborators in this whole mythic um, mythic realm. Really, it feels like you're you're really aligned in your missions uh, as well as your loves uh, in this way. So I'd just love to hear a little bit of him from you. Well, I uh, first met Daniel at Robert Bly's conference on the Great Mother and the New Father back in 2003, and immediately we have a common friend, Doug Von Koss, who does a wild character with great decades of getting communities together in singing practice, all different people who sing, don't sing, etc. And he said, you must meet Daniel. And he pulled me up off of the ferry at Anacortes to Orcas Island, that ferry from Anacortes to Orcas. Mm. I had never been in this part of the country before where I now live. And Daniel and I just gazed at each other, immediately felt a friendship of soulful artist connection. It didn't become romantic until about two and a half years later. And mm. it was just about seeing each other. And I've come to learn over the years what that was. One way was the oral tradition, his carrying old stories and also being a singer, even before he related to being a myth singer, and then my own being a singer and songwriter and deciding to be a performer in a way that would matter to life and uphold well-being for society, for culture, for everyone in from family to personally to globally to justice in the world. 
I was interested in that from the time I was like six or seven years old. So we had that simpatico from the very get-go in who we already are. And I think that somehow that little kid, as well as the grown-ups and all the years you go through, recognized each other all as kin from the get-go. So we had this uh, wonderful collaboration that he had this vision of the Myth Singer Consortium, which he led for some years online before there was a Facebook, you know, this kind of early social media. And then also his work with Martin and his work with Robert and these overlaps um, with what he often, you know, talked about the importance of myth making, mythopoesis all the time in the world and in life. And that became a center of his work and his teaching really for the last third of his life. And meanwhile, for the last 30 years, I've been doing community songwriting in uh, groups often of people who are also marginalized, elders, folks with dementia, uh, uh, folks with all different kinds of emotional and physical health situations and circumstances. And we've been writing collective songs. Daniel observed this process and said he thought he was seeing the oral tradition at its inception, which to me mm. is one of the most honoring things anyone has ever said about my work as a human being and as an artist. And I, when I asked him more what he meant by that, because I was being groomed as a folklorist in my undergrad and I only got my degree in poetics of imagination during the pandemic last year. <laughs> So there's a oh, big, big gap in between of wanting to just be in the world and not in academia. I said to him, you know, tell me more about this. It's so moving to me that you're saying this. I think I get it. And he said, you know, these old stories that I carry that I'm most interested in everyone having more access to and that I think your school is connected with is mm -hmm. the 10,000 year old stories, the stories that are much older even than that that have been distilled over generations and that are not written by an individual, but by groups of people, whole generations carry them. And then they move from generation to generation and from geography to geography as people move. And also as people inhabit nomadically different spreading regions. So they continue mm -hmm. to morph and change. And he saw this seed as the way a song might get written or a story told at its very beginnings in a community because somebody decided that facilitationally it was important and interesting for that group to address that theme or those magical ideas or this piece of wisdom or what uh, I've heard Robin Wall Kimmerer and others call the original instructions from their indigenous heritages to the next generation. How do we impart those? Through stories, through art, through different collective processes. So. In some ways, I'm now in Daniel's lineage as a myth teller, and he and Robert lies. But in other ways, our streams just colluded in this lovely way, because um, mm -hmm. I've been singing songs of, store, of bardic type songs since I started doing folk music way back when, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. It's such, uh, I just love hearing the stories of these kind of generative um, encounters, right, that lead to uh, just a yeah a, a wealth of uh, beauty, beauty making, right? That's what it feels like, and and service. Like I feel that within the quality of your partnership, and even now, of course, after through the Legacy Project, um, I'd love to touch on the book now in question, which is the I understand right the the third edition, so it's a, a the next release of this book, Daniel's. Yeah, wait, great, yeah, copy right there. <laughs> with lots of flags on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, the, the reason for the third edition and the opportunity that the third edition existing gave us is that uh, in 2020, actually right in the very same week of Daniel's birthday and our celebration of life for him after his passing, I found out that his second edition was going out of print. And Robert Simmons, who had championed that second edition and had moved his own publishing over to Inner Traditions, also was able to introduce us and the book. And they embraced it readily and have been amazing partners in thinking very thoughtfully, deeply, caringly about how to bring this book back 
in and make it accessible to many more people like yourself, Ian, who didn't get a chance to meet or hear Danny teaching in person while he was mm -hmm. here, but make sure that this book exists. And, um, you know, it's, people have talked about the connection with Joseph Campbell on one of the earlier editions. It was on the back of the cover, but uh, Bly says in here that he talks about Daniel being an inheritor of Joseph Campbell in terms of being able to allow many, many more people to have access to what myth is um, in a way that opens it up um, through his teachings, as well as does this thing that Daniel called associative mythology, connecting the dots between different cultures and seeing the motifs and really letting the stories talk to each other. So mm -hmm. that's what he does in this Beautiful. book. And what mm -hmm. I wished for is that we would have it even more relevant because it had been 13 years since the last edition that, and, and just to, for the record, in case anyone listening has the first edition, which was purple, um, that one, got expanded in edition two, which was orange. And that one um, included a whole new section Daniel himself wrote, which to me mm -hmm. is some of the finest writing and synthesis of the whole that is now in the overture section at the beginning of the book, which I'll read mm -hmm. from in a moment. But um, yes. I wanted to expand it further because it's been all these years and had Daniel himself been here, I am sure he would have taken this opportunity to write more about what he meant in terms of otherness, since that topic has now become, since 2004, when the first book came out, on everybody's tongue. You can't mm. go a day without listening to the news with people talking about othering each other, political splits, racial differences, physical differences, all kinds of uh, uh, creative even differences, people relating themselves to being other and the voices of the other and the marginalized being centered more and more and us looking at what does a plurality mm -hmm. and a diversity of culture really mean? How can we all be living in communitas, as Daniel also loves that word, you know, together, um, and be also not adapting, not diluting, not um, appropriating each other's cultures. Mm -hmm but honoring them in a way where he makes a distinction in the book in several places between adaptivity and adoptivity. And that mm. the ancient cultures would see something cool and they would adopt it in its wholeness, with its integrity, with its lineage, with its whole uh, gestalt, if you will. And they would make use of it and be giving thanks for the fact that they had received it as a gift rather than employ it or deploy it inside their own civilized so-called, you know, whatever, and turn it into a commodity or any other version mm -hmm. that severs it from its original roots, which severs it from its power, even if it becomes useful. And so mm -hmm. these ideas are laced throughout the book. Yeah, beautiful. Well, how about, I, I feel like just to read a bit of context from the uh, right up on the book, and then I'd love for you to share a bit of, of the book. Uh, but this this piece of context to me was helpful too of uh, this is the write-up that comes with the book. There is an other that lives within each of us, an exiled part that carries wisdom so desperately needed for ourselves and the culture at large. Having survived disabling polio as an infant, Daniel Deodorf knows well the oppressions of exclusion, outsiderhood, and the betrayals endured by all who are othered. He guides readers through an initiatory journey through ancient myth, wisdom, literature, and personal revelation to discover our own true identity. So I just wanted to offer that for the listeners as well to, to get a sense of the territory. And perhaps, yeah, you have a piece or you'd love to, to read from the book. Yeah, I, I drew something out and I also had uh, almost said, but didn't quite say the expanded version, what's new in it. It has all of Daniel's original writing. It has an expanded glossary. Um, it has a forward by Robert Simmons and an afterward by Martin Shaw that are new to this edition and it retains mm -hmm. all of Robert Bly's original introduction as well. Awesome. So I think I'll start here because following up with that idea of the other and also trickster wisdom, which is with throughout this book, what Daniel does is takes on page six, Jerome Rothenberg's idea that primitive means complex in terms of teaching the value and the reality the richness of originality. 
And he turns that around to also make an inversion. He says, inferior means powerful. If rational thought is superior to myth, then it will be in myth's inferiority that the greater efficacy and power reside. And myth, of course, is being considered a falsehood. And it was called inferior by Aristotle. And so he's playing on all of that in here. If rational thought is superior to myth, then it will be in myth's inferiority that the greater efficacy and power reside. Mm -hmm. A myth is a story that tells a sacred truth without the use of facts. Myth discloses value, not values, as in the moralistic or politically correct sense, but intrinsic value as valor, valent, revaluation, revelation, insight to essence and meaning. The illogical and transgressive manner by which myth works to reverse, revise, or deform our typical ideas and beliefs resembles the mythic trickster, the many-named, shape-shifting, gender-bending, ambivalent adventurer, coyote, raven, legba, loki, toqua, et al. The trickster comes as harbinger and exemplar of deformity's genius and mythopoeic, mythopoeic or mythopoeic intelligence. The trickster comes as a harbinger and exemplar of deformity's genius and mythopoeic intelligence embodying and articulating the powerful inferiority employed to leap the split between one's exterior and interior life. Hmm. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, I'm really struck by the... Um, I excerpt from the book as well that I was uh, offered, you know, in this preparation for this, where uh, Daniel wrote, writes about essentially the distinction between civilization and community, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I thought I, I was, I haven't quite heard it articulated that way either, essentially as this relationship to other and other um, in the sense of, you know, what, what is, what are we othering within, uh, within us, of course, and then who do we other, who does mass society other? Right. And why? And um, that distinction. And I'd love to actually read a bit from that as well for this uh, and, and talk about it here because sure. it did strike me so much. Yeah. But this is, uh, I guess, from the chapter uh, Aphoria, uh, Alexander's Iron Gate. Is that correct? Aphoria. Yeah. Aphoria. That's right. So he says, Daniel writes, uh, mass civilization is not community. A mature community valorizes and confirms the initiatory passages and deaths of each individual's personal and cosmic identity by its wholehearted participation in both structure and anti-structure. Whereas civilization renders the implicit individual alienated, devalued, and anonymous. Civilization is structure decreed for structure's sake. As the words of anthropologist Stanley Diamond make so profoundly clear, civilization originates in conquest abroad and oppression at home. That uh, definitely, I think, rings a few uh, notes of truth. And I think, you know, as I also look at, um, in a sense, you, you know, that you talked about in the previous quote there too, of this uh, superiority in a sense of, or at least civil society's belief in its superiority, yeah. uh, right? Of course, to the barbarian hordes or to whoever is the other and how, what the consequence of that, of course, is uh, generally a facade, right? Most people operate on uh, generally mass society under a facade that, you know, lots of people know well in the sense of, okay, this is the face you present, you know, to the world. And then, of course, everything else is happening, you know, below the surface and often comes out in all these ways, of course, which can be very destructive, you know, seeing things like, you know, mass violence, uh, 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 violence within relationship, of course. So in some sense, it's, I really appreciate that articulation of this sense of that the, the, the feigned superiority of 
you know, a civil politeness in a way does it just means that it's basically swept everything else under the rug. It swept, you know, otherness under the rug, which is continuing to cause a lot of mayhem. Whereas uh, a community, a true community, would have this is I guess my interpretation is that would read into or, or create those pathways of engagement, and not to bring in the other and make them like you exactly like you right and I hear in this homogenization project of course which is mass society um, but actually to be able to be in relationship to other that doesn't um, defeat them or doesn't uh, lower them like that to me that's an art that I feel perhaps he's speaking to uh, a lot in this book I imagine he would yeah the book has well, there's tons of different ways of holding paradox that are addressed in the book. And in fact, the whole character of Trickster is one that teaches us to make correct mistakes and hold paradox. But the um, everything that you're saying is speaking to me about one of the greatest teachings that I draw from the book and from what Daniel also taught a lot about, which is the mandorla. He used this ancient symbol of the two overlapping circles making an almond shape, um, some also refer to as the Vesica Pisces. And you mm -hmm. can find this in, if you look it up online, it will tell you a lot about Christian symbology, symbology. but the earlier versions were this overlapping liminal space of neither this nor that. So the mandorla is uh, this idea that you could have the village of civilization and the forest of the wild. And in our experience as humans and everything that has been partly or fully domesticated, what if we bring back the wild and we have the both and, but we also have the neither nor, you know, we have that place of the unknowing and yet there's the not knowing that is also full of knowing. And in terms of navigating this, um, everything that you were just saying about how, how does one live with uh, a lot of truths that are hidden under the mask, or as you were saying, the facade, you know, that we have to conform or think we have to, and yet what lives beneath. And yes, mm -hmm. there's all this roiling uh, need to express that, and it comes out in different ways. Um, for our current times, one of the things that um, Daniel spoke with, and that I think he would have expanded in this era of, uh, in terms of politically and also environmental devastation. The idea that there's mobocracy is the word, mm -hmm. you know, that there's oh. this, this sense of like, who's taking charge from this place that is the suppressed wild. And though I don't think these exact words are in the book, one of the ways Daniel would teach about this is he would talk about the free floating autonomous repressed material of the entire culture. Like, hmm. whoa, where is that? Right? It's like, oh, it could attach itself at any time. And myth is one of the ways that we learn to even discern what that is and awaken our souls and our deep knowings so that we can better discern and navigate these hmm. patterns that have been there, you know, just like the pattern of good and evil, for instance, that simplistic pattern. You know, it's just like, it's never that simple, but those things have repeated ever since humans have existed. So mm. how do we learn to navigate? He wants us to come back to the myths again and again. You've started a school mm. so that people can do that more, right? Yeah. So it's <laughs> just fantastic. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I'm gonna remember that word, mobocracy. It certainly seems to be uh, what happens, you know, out there as a, you know, mob is blunt instrument, you know, for social media, uh, uh, you know, attacks on, you know, unpopular views or people um, that, you know, I, I read, I recently read an article too, talking about how interestingly that mob movements uh, of just, I mean, in this case, maybe yeah, large groups of social media people piling on, you know, some some issue or some outrage has a very striking similar movement, I suppose, to flocks of birds, right? Starlings when, when data mapped, right? Like there's this kind of cascading uh, momentum that then picks up and then it starts to, you know, swirl. And so I found that, I mean, one is a fascinating biomimicry, right? With 
uh, with nature and that phenomenon of emergence, as, as, as it's known. And then, of course, the movement of people and attention. And, you know, within all that, what is the function of myth uh, in that in, in that direction of attention or that direction of um, relationship to right the cycles of earth that that are in a sense um, beyond logic or or you know beyond the sort of Anthropocene's attempt to craft you know a, a false reality on top of the deep rhythms of earth that seems to me cultures that are still intact and uh, or, or able to entrain to those movements, right? Myth would be a way of actually binding themselves to those, uh, to that dance, right? Versus uh, myth is just like an entertainment story, right? Of course. So there's something around medicine, of course, that, that comes into that understanding. So yeah, I wonder what Daniel might have said about that or what you might think. Well, one thing that you said earlier that I'll bring around for this is um, Alexander's Wall. So he talks about how Alexander's wall, the archetypal wall that would shut out the wild and achieve the beginnings of civilization inside as if that is safe, right? Mm -hmm. And something out there is unsafe, which is a lie. So that this uh, wall, he says, goes right down the middle of the human heart and splits the human heart. And that if we wanna become wholehearted, as I believe was in the passage that you read earlier, Myth is a way, because it's multivalent, it is looking at something, it's holographic, it's coming from every angle. It's just the way that these images have been distilled over time and the way that different voices have carried the stories and the fact that the stories, we can read them in a book, but most of all, they're meant to be read out loud and heard through all of the senses and phys physically felt. And then as Sean Kane, the great myth teller, also has written the heart of the hearer is impacted by the heart of the teller but the heart of the teller is equally impacted by the heart of the hearer so vice versa in that live exchange like our conversation everything is that conversation in the mm. at the same time uh transmission if you will of this wisdom that comes through a person who's myth telling it's not belonging to them that's the thing about becoming a story carrier and uh, honoring that. What does it mean to be a carrier of, of medicine in that way? Not self-important, not self-consciously, you know, but more like a responsibility as a way of being human to return us to our fullness as human creatures. I don't know if you have time, but I, I, there, I wanted to leave through here and possibly find another quote or two. Please, yeah. How about meanwhile, you could you could find that, and I could just name that uh, for those folks that do want to explore the book and the work of Daniel and the legacy, of course, then there's the website, mythsingerlegacy.org, which has, you know, I browsed it myself. There's tons of uh, links and, and clips and events coming up, uh, I think, around this. And of course, the order of the book for those folks who want to do that. Um, that that's the place to do it. It looks uh, uh, weighty in the right way. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate this time of uh, being able to hear from you carrying this legacy and carrying Daniel's words forward and your own flavor to it. And yeah, I'd love to hear one last quote here from, from the book in our time together. Thank you so much. Yeah, this comes back to that chapter that you were talking about. Built for posterity, the monument of the Iron Gate still stands strong. Between the known and the unknown, the locus of Alexander's wall is precisely where it has always been, in the center of the human heart. The cosmic split, the break between civilization and savagery, between village and forest, denotes the ontological gap or the soul gap, uh, the nature of being ontology he's talking about there. So the cosmic split between the village and the forest civilization and savagery denotes the ontological gap, a gap that we will recognize as the crossroads of identity, the seat of the soul. Standing divided by an ancient wall, there are amputated parts of us scattered on both sides, but we have the opportunity 
to be in conversation together, to gather those parts of ourselves, to acknowledge the lost places, to look at the void, to address the avoid dance, as uh, is also here in the book. And so many different, so many, so many, so many different strands and voices. Uh, for those who have not yet checked out this book, even if you're not directly interested in myth telling, but you're interested in all of the wisdom that's compiled, there are almost 100 different authors that are cited. And they go from Blake and Robert Graves and Joseph Campbell to uh, Clyde Ford from his book, The Hero with an African Face, and a bunch of other uh, people who over the time in song and poetry and in story have made many comments um, that Daniel was inspired by because they reflected for him ways that they talked with each other. And so as Martin Shaw says in his afterward, this book is as close as we get to understanding how thoughts flew around inside of Daniel's head. Mm. And I think that's really, really accurate. So anyone who's interested in initiatory journey, anyone who's interested in 37, I think, or maybe 39 different stories that are also um, referenced in the book. And it's only 220 pages. So you can chew on it. You know, you can take one paragraph like or one line like we've been doing and really discuss it. And a vision that we have at the Mythsinger Legacy Project is to have, uh, I have a course ever since I started preparing the book, um, it became clear to me that I have like an 18 module course which is huge. So probably there'll be uh, little workshops and other things leading up to the formation of that larger thing. Um, but it deserves a deep dive and anyone who wants to take a deep dive with it, um, please be in touch with us. So. Um, awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Well, once again, Judith K, here's the website for folks, mythsingerlegacy.org. You want to learn more and yeah, appreciate our time today. And I'm looking forward to diving deeper into the book and Daniel's legacy. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so very much. Okay. Be to well. be continued. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Crow's Nest. Please consider writing a review on Apple Podcasts and sharing this episode with your friends. To learn more about the School of Mythopoetics and attend our upcoming events, visit schoolofmythopoetics.com.